the honor and pleasure to have with us Reverend Maria Yerushalmi. Reverend Yerushalmi lives in California, and um, she is a renowned, world-renowned speaker. I, I know that she has a lot of followers that go crazy over her, and we're really excited and very um, enthusiastic about tonight about um, Reverend Maria Yerushalmi to be speaking to us tonight. So here you go. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm so happy for this moment because uh, Baruch Hashem, I do weekly classes on Shabbat. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Miriam? Let's try again. I'm muted. Oh. Hello? Can you Thank okay. you so much. So I'm really thankful for this opportunity because I do Baruch Hashem weekly Shabbos classes and Lately, I've been not been able to do as many recordings as being a new grandma, but so this opportunity makes me really happy to share what I shared on Shabbos. Um, first of all, the title, Beautiful Like a Kala, I um, one day was like reading something um, in uh, the deep teachings of the Torah, how our thoughts, speech, and actions actually are like garments for our soul. So when you think about the infinite soul that you have, each thought, speech, or action, each mitzvah done actually elevates your soul infinitely. And you know, we women, we think about garments, silk, satin, and, and you know, velvet. And I was thinking like, you know, wow, like I'm dressing up my soul in this beautiful way. And then I was thinking, like, who is the best dress, you know? A kala, a bride. How does she actually get dressed up in the morning with excitement to go get her earrings and to go get her makeup done and to put all the garments uh, all put together? And with joy and happiness, she goes about the day because she knows, like, tonight's the night. This is, like, maybe the, you know, the the days and years she's been waiting for. So I was thinking, you know, wow, imagine if we wake up every morning with this kind of attitude on all the things that we do. Because honestly, everything that we do, even not like a technical mitzvah of praying or learning Torah, I mean, we're cleaning the house. It's like, a, you know, the Kohanim and the Beit Tamidash cleaning up, you know, like all the things that we do daily, feeding our body, exercising, taking care of the most of the mundane things is a mitzvah. And so I was really trying to remind myself every day to wake up like the feeling of, uh, of, of how a, a bride would feel every day anew. And this came to me as I was reading the Parsha, because the Parsha teaches us of last week, Baha of the clouds of glory and the, the amazing protection the Jewish people had um, and the way, you know, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu went up in the mountains with this cloud. Everything that we're taught about these clouds represents Torah and mitzvah and what it does for us. So just like uh, the, uh, the, the beauty of a person comes out when they are choosing the most gorgeous garments, uh, so too, like garments uh, are not only to beautify us, but also help elevate and protect us. Because kind of like, you know, the vision of a cloud of Moshe going up, you know, and the idea of like everything you do, like even the smallest of things, that smile that you didn't feel like it, elevates your soul infinitely. Like if you really stop and think about it, you just be like, whoa, like how could it be? We can't even wrap our mind around the, the awesome feeling elevating our soul infinitely. But it also protects our soul liken to garments that you wear to protect yourself against the elements. If you go, you know, to a vacation where there's snow and, you know, you're taking your kids snow stooming or something, you're not going to go out with, like, summery clothing. Otherwise, you'll have to, like, run to actually come back into, you know, the cabin. 
And so the scarf, the, 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 the jacket, and the boots are all necessary for you to be able to withstand the elements of the weather. So too, these garments of, of our thought, speech, and action as it's applied to Torah and Mitzvah act like a protection. Of course, we know tzedakah tzitzil mimavid. And of course, we know when we do Torah and Mitzvah, it's like we're going to be rewarded down the road. But really, today, you know, the protection is not only for, you know, uh, diseases and, and, and mishappenings and, and, and so forth, that um, we really, really, really have this power to protect our mind. As the teaching goes, it's like you, if you can imagine... Um, you know, like those knight in shining armor uh, images of the iron coat like chink of chinky chinky uh, steel of armor around this, this, this warrior. So every mitzvah becomes, and every, especially tzedakah, becomes like a, a coat of armor, not only to protect us against all the elements of the world, but against ruach shtus against the confusion of the mind. And if you could see me, I would show you my hands as if it's a gate. Uh, and every mitzvah like closes up the gaps of the gates, just like every uh, you know, metal of armor that collectively makes that full protection, the, the, the mind is protected against the eight Saharas, against the, the Rakshtud is like the, the spirit of folly, like the, the mind getting confused by an idea that's really alien and really against what you really would have wanted to do. If you really thought it through at a, a calmer, more, you know, present, grounded state. You know, and the Lubavitcher Rebbe actually teaches us that just like when you have a house and, and you have, uh, you know, access to the roof, you have to make sure you build a gate so that the person and, and the people can't, you know, succumb to falling, you know, because of the, the lack of the protection. So Torah... Uh, and, and, and all the mitzvahs actually create this protection also around our helm, uh, like a, a, a helmet, so that we won't fall prey to, the, to, the, to these, you know, um, whims of our Yetzirah. And now we know that also when the Jewish people were escaping from Mitzrayim and, and, and the, t the deep teachings of the two walls, you know, uh, and the miracle of the double walls, and the reasoning why Hashem made such a double miracle, because normally, you know, Hashem doesn't want to, like, overdo his, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, his miracles. He wants to do it in the, in, in the way that he doesn't have to, like, put so much more energy into it, in its simplicity. But he did this master, you know, minded miracle of separating these waters to teach us that, that we really need to be protected from all sides. And one of the walls represents tefillah, and the other wall represents Torah. And that way we can march forward of this protection to reach our holy of holies, of our holy land, our neshama. And so we see that um, it's very, very easy to um, sometimes wake up and like, you know, there's so much to do in a day and there's so much like challenges and, 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 and it's just like ugh, another th thing that I have to do on my to-do list. And, and sometimes because life can be difficult, the mitzvahs became, become burdensome. But the more we understand the power of what we're, we're achieving in the moment of just a single mitzvah, the more we can change the attitude of less being burdened by it and really feeling not only lighthearted about it in a good way, but bubbly and excited and like beaming with joy that we have this opportunity. In one of the teachings of the Tanya, it says that when you do mitzvah, it's like creating this pillar of uh, 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 like, 
you know, you go to the, I don't know if you've ever been to, you know, Caesarea and, you know, in Israel, or you see these like Colosseum museums and they have these big columns and they're so gorgeous and they're so grand and they're so tall. Like, you know, I was imagining like, this is what happens. We're building such a fortified column, literally in, 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 in our neshama, to give us the strength to go higher and higher and reach like the, the best of ourselves. And so, you know, it, it's not only that we get this incredible protection uh, of the mind, but something so fascinating that I actually learned from the Tzemach Tzedek, there was a book on the holidays uh, uh, and the deep teachings of the holiday, which teaches us something that happened in the Beit HaMikdash that was like super miraculous as the destruction was taking place and there was like a slashing of the curtains when Titus came in to show his power that he was going to destroy the Beit HaMikdash and what happened there was an oozing of blood out of this uh, curtain and why was this strange kind of gory almost miracle happening to show us that Torah is our blood, it's our life force. And had we learned more Torah, then our blood wouldn't have easily been dispersed. Like God forbid someone's not well and their, their blood is not well, that's where sickness st starts. Or when someone has an obstruction through the arteries and then there's this, this God forbid, sudden inability of the heart to work, God forbid. So too, that uh, in this imagery, Hashem was showing us that when we learn Torah, just like blood that becomes strong and vibrant and healthy, our physical blood gets healthy. As the teaching says, Torah keeps us joyful. And the more joy we have, it actually makes our healthy blood. And when we have that healthy blood, our body functions better. Our mind is sharper and clearer. But also in this deep teaching, it was sharing with us that just like blood that and then gets uh, refined and then the, the refined blood goes to the brain. And then from the brain, the choices of blood then goes to all the different limbs from which one is the most important, the heart and, and after that, all the others. So too, when we learn Torah, we elevate Hashem's life force. And that then comes back down to us and gets distributed from our efforts of learning Torah, we then get God's actually choices of blood, meaning his energy, his brachas, his, his kedusha, his holiness, his blessings, and all the incredible, like, you know, shefa, which is like all the incredible, like, uh, like pouring over of goodness that he wants to give us. In fact, recently I was learning in one of the teachings um, that, uh, again, the deep teachings of the whole story of what happened in, um, w with the experience of Adam and Chava, and, and, and really analyzing how did they fall prey to, you know, just like, don't eat the apple or whatever for an hour, like, come on, you're in Ghanaian, what, what's going on wrong in your life that it was so hard? with such revelations in Gan and why, why was it so hard for them to like not have the power to withstand the test for just one hour, literally. So the teaching is, is that what was their sin to begin with? Not that they really t partook the, of, of the tree of, of uh, good and evil. Had they eaten from the tree of life, which represents, had they really studied the Torah, the deep secrets of the Torah, they would have had the strength to fight the Yetzirah, not to then go and delve into the temptation of eating from the tree of good and evil. So it's so important to really take the time and understand that these teachings help us 
help us feel like, um, you know, uh, alive, vibrant, and joyful. Help us feel like nothing can bother us like a Kala. She's so excited for her day. And like this one will say something. Her whole focus is on, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, this is my day. And this is my day to feel beautiful like a bride. And, and she's so focused on the joy of the day. Oh, another day or maybe a week later after the shiva bracha is okay. It might wear off a little bit, but what we're trying to do here, and whether you're married, not married, and you know, looking for your b'sher, like this message is for everyone. Like to be able to really open our eyes and see so many blessings of what happens to us, and 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 focus on more of the good that is happening rather than the really you know. The, some of the anxieties that people have. Oh, I, I, I'm not good enough. I want to be better davening. I want to. I'm not good enough on this. And 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 they have such a heartache that they're carrying with them this burden that they're not good enough for Hashem. And and they're shame before their very self. And all in the name of God that they want to be, you know, you know, elevated. And 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 somehow they have a very difficult time doing that. And so it's it's a shame. It's so it's, it's so. It's, it, it takes away from the joy of being alive and doing Torah and mitzvahs. If they could just switch over and have this beautiful like a bride mentality. Because really, more we learn Torah, the Yetzirah does get transformed. It's like a spice to change the Yetzirah to a Yetzir Tov. You know, the Gemara teaches us. You know, so it does help us have the understanding that it's not that we're so scared that we're not going to get the blessings. It's so scared that we're not going to get like all the, you know, um, uh, the, re uh, the rewards or all the punishments. It's like living the moment for now. As we are taught, don't look back. What was, was. You did the best that you could with the tools that you did at the time and God didn't give you the tools back then. Let go, because if you look back, you become bitter. Yes, have a resolve to go forward the next day, just like in the Parsha with the trumpets and, and going to war. Why would they do trumpets and then march joyfully? Because the joy helps us, helps us march forward and conquer the day. If we're too looking back and we too focus on, you know, the, 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 even some people really are scared of being punished and that's archaic. We don't live that way anymore. You know, when teenagers were teenagers and toddlers are toddlers, they're, they're, they're taught certain things, that, you know, and the parents have to like treat them a certain way because, you know, because they're young and they're in their youth. But once they get in that adult stage, and, and you're trying to have a relationship with your children, it's not about teaching them to not do this or they'll be punished. This is how you have a relationship with an adult. Back in the days when we were toddlers in the beginning of our journeys of being a people, yeah, Hashem used scare tactics and timeouts, if you want to call it, and punishment uh, theories of, of a sort in that way to get us motivated. But now, when the more we delve into the depths of the Torah, the more we understand, it's not God wanting to punish us. It's just like you put a, 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 a shirt in the laundry and it's going in the bubbles and it's getting seemingly like squished and, and, and almost tortured. It's not being punished. There's a stain and there's a process of cleansing and, and going through the motions of what needs to be done to like remove the stain. When we see it that way, then it then we're it's just so redeeming. It's just so redeeming. So, you know, so many times people uh, can't really connect to like the loving father because they haven't really learned as much about how God is so lovesick for them and how God is so benevolent and kind and and forgiving and extra forgiving. God is like helping us go through the stages of our personal and spiritual and emotional and mental development with kindness and with love. And when we see it that way, then we have the wherewithal to not get in that negative um, trying 
and difficult energy of living in our own skin because it's so hard sometimes, you know, your spouse, your children, your neighbors, the, you know, all the social media and, and making you feel like, you know, not so uh, holy and, and not like they want you to be or whatever it is sometimes. And, and really you have to live with yourself 24 seven there, you know, you see your husband, how many hours, your children, how many hours. So like this cleansing of our mind in this way, helping us keep strong to let nothing in our way diminish our fervor and our excitement to do whatever we can to be that close and bonded with Hashem. And when, when we look at some of the teachings of how to like, what wisdom does for us and how to really keep the wisdom, there's a teaching that Chochmah, which is wisdom, is like a dot in the palace. And just like there's, you know, a dot, like in this huge palace, right? You're just like, what are you paying attention to? It's nothing, right? You know, but that's the way the first initial flash of wisdom come to us when we, let's say, learn something. But then it's so easy to like, just like, you know, there's a dust and then the wind comes and you can't see it anymore. So meditating developing the habit of contemplating what you're learning, what you're praying about. All this takes your wisdom and makes it and builds it and develops it so that it doesn't just vanish like a dot. So too, like, you know, there was this professor and he, he actually gave this paper to all of his students and he put a dot on a paper and he said, you know, what do you see on this paper? All of them saw the dot. <laughs> and he said, why didn't you see the white all around? No one mentioned, oh, there's white around the dot, or there's white and there's a dot. Everyone said they only saw the black in the dot. So when, the, when our wisdom was like a dot, then we really get in the habit of always, like we, we, we become, I don't know what it's called, like, uh, you know, um, fault finders. Everything we see, the darkness of it. Everything is bothersome. Everything is annoying. But when you have such a mentality, like I, every mitzvah elevates my soul so much infinitely more, and everything that I do is causing my chokmah, my being, all my being in my das, all my intellectual faculties, my to unite with Hashem. It's like I'm. You have the image of the cloud, the pillars. Oh my! Like it's like then, you know, then you're not as easily taken aback by the people around you and the circumstances of your life. Then you don't just see the dot. There was once a woman who was going on and on and on about, like, you know, a situation that was happening. You know, she did some renovations and the plumbers were not doing the job. And and she said she kept obsessing, she couldn't sleep, she kept, it was all day long and like bothering her and bothering her. And I gave her an example of like, you know, like a garden and you have like this amazing garden, but this squirrel is like digging up a little hole in the garden. It's so little, it's nothing, it's like a scratch. And for you're looking at, at that, like if you just look at the whole big picture, you have a gorgeous home, you have, you know, what most people don't have, you know, and, and, you know, and your brain is obsessing over something that's so really trivial compared to what really is the bigger picture of life. So you got to harness that power of your mind to like, to um, switch it to like the beauty of all that is happening good in your life. And so it happened to be, there was a moment in time in my life where I you know, was, was uh, kind of leaving my hometown in Israel and it was just like, I don't know, for a wedding and a, and a, a, a baby that was about to be born. So my husband had this business opportunity, so we went. But one thing led to the next and eight years later, I never saw my family. I, I don't know, I can't even tell you all the journeys of how many things happened that prevented me from getting back. And I remember just like how 
incredibly powerful that moment was, how magical it was when I finally saw everyone together and I was like holding on to them like, is this for real? Like, I, like I'm, I'm seeing you, I can't believe this. It was like, and I, I just felt, it was so beautiful and it was like, it was like breathtaking. I, I, I don't know, words can't even describe the feeling of being reunited. You can only imagine the Holocaust survivors and what they went through got reunited. But, but I remember feeling like, so beautiful. I want to capture this. I, I want to try to remember every day to experience the beauty of the people that I, I, I see every day that somehow, you know, many people can lose that, you know, that sensitive excitement of, of the, the miracle moment of having another moment in, in our lives together and, and appreciation. So, we, we want so much to, um, you know, try our best to allow that happy feeling and that, that zest for our, our moments in our day, including not only when we do the Torah and mitzvahs, but ben adam chavero, between us and the people around us, so that we, um, you know, so that we really maximize the beautiful moments in that way. I incredible. I read a story about the Chafetz Chaim recently, and I'm just like, whoa. I was just like, I can't imagine that level, like, of the, the mitzvah that he did. He was um, in this house, I guess, and someone ran off stealing, like, a lot of what he owned. And the Chafetz Chaim said, I am um, disowning all that you have in my, uh, in, uh, the, in your possession, basically. Uh, whatever that was mine, I'm disowning it. And what did, and why did the Chafetz Chaim do that? Because he cared so much for this person that he didn't want the person to carry uh, the, the title of a thief, in, in, like kind of embranded in his soul. So by him, you know, um, basically disowning his stuff at that moment made the thievery not to be labeled as a thievery. And it's kind of like what Moshe Rabbeinu did when he was like seeing all the craziness of the Jewish people worshiping the idols. He broke the, the evidence that there is a, a contract between God because he just didn't want you know, there to be any kind of a commitment in writing that they were doing something wrong. So, like, imagine that level of care and precision of, like, saving the day. I, I just was like, wow. I was just like, I, I, I was just so touched by such a story. You know, so many times when... Um, you know, when we're going through something, we don't see the results of everything that we did for other people. And, and uh, even sometimes we're like doing so many mitzvahs and so many like self-sacrifice. My goodness, really, come on. And we're just like, sometimes like enough already. I, I'm not seeing the results of my, my efforts, whether it's your children, your spouse sometimes, life in general, people, mitzvahs that you do, where's it going? And that was the message of Shavuos actually. When God said, I am your God, and there was no echo. So yeah, why there was no echo? Well, one is, can you imagine, I am your God, I am your God. It would look like, you know, there's a war going on between more than one God. But really the deeper message of why was because an echo happens because there's an obstacle. The voice hits the obstacle, and then it bounces off that obstacle, so then there's an echo. God was teaching a lesson. Sometimes all your efforts seemingly doesn't bounce back at you. Seemingly you think it's like in one ear and out the other ear because you did this and this to this person and they're just not, you know, not influenced, not hearing you, not, not being changed by you in all your efforts, or even your mitzvahs. You think you did so much, you know, why am I not seeing the miracle in my life here and now? 
Well, first of all, you never know. Like, first of all, the Lubavitch Rebbe said, even like keeping modesty, you know, and keeping the halacha of, of uh, 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 in, in, a, in a way that you don't see that it could have saved a life in Eretz Yisrael. You don't see maybe that there was supposed to be, God forbid, an accident in your life maybe even, and the accident didn't have, you know, happen, so you, you don't see it. But even if really you don't see it, in, in a sense, and it's affecting the whole world, actually. It's like unbelievable. Like even non-Jews become closer to Hashem because of respect and honor and love between and the intimacy of a husband and wife. Like it's, it's like you can't, you don't know how it's really influencing the whole world. But it is being absorbed into the world and it is affecting the world and it is causing change that you can't see. You know, kind of like the bamboo tree there was a video going around at one point where, you know, a farmer asked, uh, was asked by, uh, you know, why is he, you know, watering the plants for so long? And, and, and so the, uh, the farmer said, well, uh, you plant the seeds and yeah, you're watering for five years. You don't see the blossom, but what do you think is happening in those five years? that deep within the ground, roots and roots and roots and roots are being, um, you know, solidified and, 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 uh, and growing stronger and thicker so that when in 60 days of the five years that now these tall bamboo shoots, like 90 feet tall, I think, whatever the exact, it like happens in such a short period of time because of the roots that were growing all those five years to allow these shoots, the strength to stand up. So yes, you're doing Torah mitzvahs, and yes, you feel like it's not echoing in your self-transformation and your elevation and all the miracles you want for yourself, but things are happening inside. And, and, and we gotta, like with those like happy, you know, go lucky energy, and with singing a tune, you know, um, through it, just like when, you know, when, when uh, the Jewish people actually were carrying the Aaron, they said that you should, you know, they should be singing, just like when they had the trumpets when going to war, but they should be singing while they were carrying, you know, the ark. So, of course, it was, uh, you know, a, a, a job that wasn't maybe so easy physically. I'm sure maybe miracles happened. But, but the idea was that, that while you're carrying a load, try your best to sing through it. You know, um, because carrying a tune is the same, like, word as carrying a load. And the message is, is it, it seems like heavy. It seems, um, you know, so hard. It seems like even though you're putting so much effort and you're not seeing the fruits of your labor, but that, um, you know, that, that, that there are things happening. And the more simcha you have, if you look at the root word simcha, it also has the letters of Mashiach, that you really tap into a miraculous salvation. You're accessing with your bitachon and your muna, and you really trust in Hashem, and you're not letting it, you know, as easily, you know, shut you down or, or cave you in, you know. You feel buried like a seed, but you know the seed that's buried is going to be a blossom, and even though it appears to be like, like it's being buried, right? So too, we bypass any kind of, of um, judgment because like, you know, there, there's a process after a certain level of, um, uh, of, you know, kind of like, well, let's see, you know, what, how she's been. Merits, no merits, and then Okay, and then there's like a, a moment in time where there has to be a kind of a decision made. But when you show Hashem, I have bitachon, 
I'm happy to do your mitzvahs, even though I didn't get rewarded seemingly. I, I'm happy to like go the extra mile and have this self-sacrifice. I'm going to like feel beautiful like a bride doing whatever I can and not let whatever is happening around me like taint my whiteness and my purity as best I can. Then you surpass and, and, and bypass that judgment of a sort and that is your merit for salvation and so you increase your ability to bring down these salvation so there was a story of um this shipwreck and in the shipwreck the the people were so devastated and they're finally on dry land and and they're hearing and the howling of animals and and the weather is just so scary and by miracle someone came and a crew came to to come in and take them to a safe place but they said you know i might take you now out of this place and you'll be happy now but later you'll be disappointed or you could stay overnight you'll be a bit disappointed but tomorrow morning you'll see you'll be that much happier and so they decided they couldn't bear it they didn't know just take us we don't care and they said okay before you leave fill up your pockets and and then we'll go so the, fill up your pockets with what's on the ground and, and go so they did and so when, when they arrived at the safe place you know this angel of a rescuer said now do you feel happy and they said yeah and he, then he said okay great next morning he said i want you now all to look what you put in your pockets take it out don't forget so he took out the gems were gems they were on a diamond field and now they realize oh had they known they would have stayed there this is like a parable in our life, you know, things seem so burdensome, it seems so, I just want to like, get out of here, let me just be done with this already, but if we only knew the gem of the moment, if we only knew the power of this mitzvah, the power of what's happening in our neshama, the power of how we're really co-creators with Hashem, to really make the perfectly imperfect world a slightly more perfect and hopefully more perfect and more beautiful and more, you know, elevated. So, you know, I, I tell you, the mentality shift is everything. I mean, I mean, research is showing when we're really, you know, having a happy mental outlook it just does wonders for every part of us. So the Shabbos, we had a lot of guests. One of my dear Rebbitsons had to be out of town. They have many kids, and I invited them to come uh, and be our guest. And I was like a lot on the floor most of the night, sitting, reading them stories and playing with them. And my husband so beautifully, you know, appreciated and said, wow, I was just like, I was so so proud of you, so impressed that you really cared about all these children and made them feel like, you know, they're busy with a mommy, basically. It's like, wow, that's so nice. And, and, I, and I was thinking, and I'm like, you know what? You know where it all started? Where the simple things in life were equal to the grand things in life? I remember reading a story, and I told him, there was a Holocaust survivor, um, but during the Holocaust, while they were digging ditches, and, and really hard labor. One man was like singing his way through it. And some of the men were like wondering, did he, did he flip? Did he have like a mental breakdown that how could, he's digging ditches for dead bodies and, and he's singing? Like he must be, he must be, you know, I guess now mentally deranged, he just lost it. And the other one said, no, there's something to him. I don't know. And the other one was saying, no, no, like, there, it's, it's impossible. So one said, well, maybe he was always a dig ditcher, you know. So he's managing. He's, he's coping. We were lawyers and doctors, and we had, you know, high positions in society, and it was stripped away from us. And, and 
they were like kind of like back and forth. La, <laughs> lo and behold, one says, let's just go ask him, what was his profession? Let's just find out what's with this. How can he be singing? So, you know, so they approached him and, he, and this person said, wow, I'm, I, my profession, I, I'm, I'm a servant of Hashem. And I, I, I try to be a servant of Hashem always. So like, sometimes something seems so minuscule, so nothing, and so, ugh, like, someone else do it, you know? Or it just seems so lowly for who, you know? But really, like, imagine everything that we learned today. I mean, we know uh, Torah is like bread. It nourishes our neshama. Torah is like milk where it whitens us and purifies our negative character traits and it makes us shine like milk in, in that way and it's just like so much it gives us that protection and beautifies us oh so much and you know when we when we see that, that we're we're trying our best to not minimize you know um the moment there was another incredible story that I also recently read, and I was just like, I mean, really, I don't know, when I learn, it just like almost brings me to like, like uh, instant aha moments again and again, like I, you know, and one of, uh, and I could say this for everything I learned, but, so it's like, you know, maybe redundant to say it so many times, but I'm telling you, I was just like, my mouth was open, and I was like, whoa, you know, um, the the um, story uh, is with uh, with uh, Elie Wiesel, who was a Holocaust survivor, and he actually his dream was to go back home. Why? Because before he ran away from his home, he buried his most valuable gift that his mom gave him and he buried it underground. And he wanted to get back. He wanted that watch. That was his legacy. That was his like last hope of some connection to his mother. And he did eventually get go back. And he did go to the place where he buried his watch. And he did find the watch. But he writes, as soon as he got that watch, he right away buried it. And he walked away, never to return again to get it. And he really felt like he had to bury the past. He wants nothing to do with it. And in a way, when I was reading this story, that's really what we have to do almost every moment of our day sometimes, because it's so easy to feel like not beautiful like a bride. It, it, it could really, like we said earlier, it could really, you know, take our mind away from, you know, feeling the godly moment and the incredible opportunity to just be that simple servant of Hashem with all the small things that aren't so small. I remember one person asked me, I want you to like really help people like to, to manifest and bring out their talents so they could use it and be productive. And I'm like, honestly, like let's just be one less jerk in the world. That's a big, big accomplishment. Like so many people feeling so lowly because they're not accomplishing things. They're not like their neighbors. They're not this, they're not. Like what's really important? How many likes we get, how many social media, you know how many people have like millions of dollars, have the honor of the world at their fingertips, and, and they feel like dying and they, I don't want to say what they do to them, they end their, I don't even want to say, like, they have everything, they really were accomplished, they were really successful, honors of all the kinds of the world, but if your soul is not happy with who you are, and yes, we have to be at peace with the process of becoming who we are supposed to be. Look at the mitzvah. Right after the Jewish people got the Torah, one of the mitzvahs was Korban Shloimim, which is a lesson for us, we are taught. Shloimim is from the word Shalem. And we have to sacrifice, and we're not Shalem. And we have to be Shalom, be at peace with the process. 
so that we can be happy for the moment that we just did this one thing. And if we did not do something like we wanted to, we're also able to be happy. Why? Because we know Hashem forgives us. So, and, and, and even Tanya says, like, even the lowest of lowest of person should feel even happier. Why? Even though he's not so great like the greats. Because Hashem is with him? <laughs> there's no excuse for feeling lowly. There's, there's just no excuse. In fact, the Baal Shem Tov teaches us that what is the real tshuva we have to do? Real tshuva is stop thinking about yourself. That's the tshuva that we have, that we're not good enough. To work. And the, the Rebbe actually teaches us what is the tshuva that we have to do? Is that we don't, we don't even, we don't know how great we are. We don't know how godly we are. We don't respect our, our, our infinite, incredible neshama that we have. So, stop thinking about yourself and more have God consciousness and the joy of being able to be connected with this infinite creator. Now, just like the animal kingdom elevates the vegetation, just like we elevate the animals in the vegetation, when we learn Torah and we do Torah and mitzvahs, God subsumes and elevates us because our brain can get us in trouble like we all see. We don't think we're good enough, we're not accomplished, we, all those faculty of imagination running wild to cause havoc. This spirit of folly just can attack to, to our mind. And we're taught if we're all day obsessing on something, even like, like the Shem Shemaim, in the name of God, I wanna, oh, I can't believe I behaved that way, <laughs> and all day long, and I, how many calls I get like that? Stop, you know that's a Yetzirah, the Baal Shem Tov says. If you're constantly even thinking of yourself all day long that you weren't good enough and you didn't do true, that's a sign it's a Yetzirah. Because you should be with joy and with simcha to, to do another moment of devekus with Hashem, to do another mitzvah, to help another person, to, to be involved. You know, the tzaddik who died almost in tears not knowing where he's going to be in Gan Eden or not. He was so busy. You know, and one time some person wrote to the Lubavitcher Rebbe and, and he, the letter was written back with all circles of I, 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 I'm not good in the I, I wish I would have asked. And the Rebbe said, if you notice how many times the I is in the letter, go out and keep busy with helping others. You won't have time to think about your I. That's where depression, anxiety comes from. Too much focus on the I. Anyway, so... We have an incredible opportunity to help ourselves switch the old ways of thinking. We have to be understanding of the tactics of the Yetzirah. We have to continuously study Pnimi Yuta Torah, the, the, the inner essence and the deep secrets of the Torah that helps us understand these things. Yes, we have to do nigla and we have to do the halachas and that's very important. But just as important, we need this kind of information. Because honestly, it's so easy for the, this, the, these, this mind to just get snatched. And that's why when the Jewish people were leaving with Shrine, and the first, uh, 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 the, the, actually it was the, the, the the tenth plague of the killing of the firstborn of the Mitzrim represented the Mitzri inside of us, our intellect that is really the ungodly intellect, if you want to call it. And the redemption of the firstborn son was the kind of symbolism of the godly intellect of being redeemed. And what happened after that is they had to leave Mitzrayim because in your head is where there are constrictions. In your head is, is, is uh, it's like if you look at the, in the Shema, it says, that you have to take the Torah and put it in your heart. 
Sam Tem, which is to put, is also the word Sam Tam. Sam is a drug. So if you keep your Torah knowledge in your head, it actually can become a poison to you. You can be arrogant, you can look down at people, you can make differentiations, and you can like not tolerate people because now you know better, you know? And use this pompous uh, way of uh, uh, interacting with people because you're so holier than thou. No, you have to escape your head. You have to take the Torah and run with it to your heart. To your heart? Well, guess what? There's a very <laughs> challenging journey to get the knowledge into your heart. That's the, the, the secrets in the deep teachings of the Torah of how to get knowledge into your heart by meditation and prayer, by specific meditations that we learn. By the way, I have a uh, prayer and meditation book that discusses all those in details. Hopefully we we'll can join again and Otherwise, there are classes of mine on my website, yournewheights.com. I'm on Torah anytime. I also have a, several YouTube channels, brain training channels, also for children. So get your children. Also, this uh, book that I wrote based on the true story, Carrying a Tune and Sfas, with the idea of like singing through your challenges. Um, and here's the children's book I also wrote, Beautiful Like a Bride, giving these important messages to our children so they don't have to wait till they're 50 and 60 years old having you know only gotten to study it when they were older um, because it's so much like oxygen you know um, knowing that you know when you learn Torah it either can be like this drug that makes you arrogant or and like a poison or it can be like a drug that is giving you life, giving you oxygen. It's, it's a medicine. It's, it's, it's also like, like wine. You know, what happens when you drink wine? You get a little happier. Secrets come out. But when you drink the wine of Torah, which is the deep secrets of the Torah, it helps bring your neshama out and all the secrets of who you truly are. More and more redemption of your neshama. And that's why that whole story of like, you know, killing of the firstborn, redemption of the firstborn, and running away from your mind because you can't stay in your mind. You have to run with the information by meditating and contemplating and really reviewing 101 times so that it, it could land in your heart because the light of the wisdom of Torah needs to land in your heart. Yes, prayer in the morning, the fiery words, clear your heart and circumcise your heart, getting rid of the layers of blockages, so then your heart is open. And so then you learn Torah right after, and then the light of what you learn can come inwardly into your heart. And that's why it says, Vidibarta bam, that the secret also ingredient is to speak the words of Torah, because speaking of the words of Torah allows that godly power of the wisdom of Hashem to kind of not only impregnate your brain with God's wisdom so that you will give birth to the amazing positive emotions that are there but just like you know when you plant a seed you, know, you need to put rain water on it and, and there's a whole kind of everything needs to be done in a certain way so that blossom will blossom this is the secret ingredient to help your neshama blossom and come out because the seed of, of your soul is there. You just need all the ingredients, the sunshine, the light of God's Torah to like beam in your heart so that more of that becomes revealed and is capable of blossoming. So I bless you all that when you wake up in the morning now, you have this image of this beautiful bride and think about now all the beautiful things that are on your to-do list and see it as it's worth in the infinite worth that it's worth hopefully not feeling as heavy-hearted hopefully having a little more zest a little more you know highest and, and liveliness to your the duties of your day 
and definitely, definitely not let anything around you take away from really the feeling of how beautiful you truly are. Because your neshama is shining. Hello? Yes. Hi, it's Arista. I did have to get off, so she asked me to take over. So first of all, thank you for your most beautiful and inspiring words. Do you have a few minutes to answer some questions? Yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna um, press start for so unmute everybody, and then we'll see who has questions. One second, please. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, you're really high on life. I love it. Thank you're, you. That's it. You really, you you walk the walk and talk the talk. A Torah talk. Thank you. Um, you know what I've noticed that there are men that whistle, and when they whistle, it's sort of a sign that they're happy. And I'm wondering why didn't the Hashem why don't women whistle? I wonder. It's interesting that you're saying whistling because the Rebbe would whistle. Did you know that? The Lubavitcher Rebbe used to no. whistle. Yes, and then everyone I'm in unison. Intuitive. It's so interesting. And everyone together was whistling. You know the famous song, Whistle While You Work? <laughs> well, we can whistle. Right. We can whistle through our work, but it's not really work. It's yeah, yeah. Is that the Rebbe Schneerson? Yes. Did he whistle? Yes, he did whistle, and he got the whole group of Hasidim. I've seen the video with my very eyes. I didn't just hear it or read it, and it was so fascinating. He was trying to elevate the level of happiness by, um, and I recently saw it, actually. I've seen it again and again, but recently I saw it. I was so touched and moved. But um, I whistle. I whistle all the time with my, it's so cute, my mom whistles to my grandson, and then I whistle. Or, and then we had a four-way conversation, and my sisters were like, why are you whistling? And we're just like, happiness, just whistle. We were all starting to whistle on a four-way, you know, because you could do four-way on WhatsApp, and we're actually seeing each other whistle. It was very special. <laughs> True story. Can you, can you, my, you whistle now? Can you whistle a little? Um, I'm not such a good whistler. <laughs> this is like the most fun request I've ever had. Thank you. I love singing. I love dancing. Uh, I also like whistling, actually. And uh, um, I wish I was better. You know what? I'm going to start trying to do it more often. <laughs> you know, men That's whistle, but women. Don't men whistle? They go, whoo, whoo. Well, we have to be modest, you know. I was I was uh, amongst women whistling, and uh, even though it's not kol isha, but we don't want to draw attention to ourselves in public. But I'm saying in your home, nobody's home, or you're with your grandchildren or children, or whatever, you know, enjoy and you know whistle for sure. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. You made me even happier tonight. Wow, I didn't think that could be possible. I'm remembering the memory of the Rebbe whistling, so now I'm going to, like, you know, wow. take it upon myself to do it did even he, more. Did he get the whole congregation? Yes, the whistling. whole congregation is uh, whistling. Wow. You can go on Gems and you can see that video. It was so beautiful, really. Can you repeat your name again? My name is Miriam Yerushalmi. I also write articles on Chabad.org. I have videos on tour anytime and again my website is yournewheights.com i've written over 28 children's books with a lot of these messages oh. and five adult books and oh. new are coming baruch hashem why don't you go on jbs you know he does they do a book every every day they, they have like a book and they Gonna talk about it. Oh, maybe you can recommend it, them. The That's a great idea. Maybe you can so call and please. recommend them. Thank you. Because <laughs> I, I love to read children's books. Yeah, I I, I. I have, you know, my inner child, my Jewish inner child, 
But you know what? I actually. I like pictures. I, I, I like pictures. Wow, I know. That's why I actually, when writing these children's books, I meant it for adults as well. So when they're reading it to their children, they yeah. could benefit too. I promise you, that was my intention. Well, are you with one publisher? Can I get a list of all your books? Um, I'm not with one publisher, but you can go on my website and they're all there. They're in Spanish, oh, okay. Hebrew, and in Yiddish, many of them. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. Yeah. Anyway, so nice to meet hi. you. Hi. Well, thank hi. you. Thank you so much. Maybe someone else wants to ask a question? You, you, made my day, you made my day in a wonderful way. Thank you. Thank you. You did too, Hello. my dear. And I also Hi. say God bless you and you didn't have to sneeze. <laughs> I made that up. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, my name's Lisa. How are you? Nice to meet you. Um, first off, Muzzle Tub on the Baby. Yes. Oh, um, my gosh. Miracles. Yes. For and um, that was beautiful. Um, you know, one of the things you were saying about, you know, appreciating, I've had, like, a lot of loss in my life. And I live, well, right now I live in Norfolk, Virginia. And, you know, of course, like, come May, it becomes, like, a thousand degrees. But it's also becomes flowers and greenery and everything, like, really early. And so one of the things that I aspire to is nature. I'm all about, like, nature and animals and whatever. And um, I always find it so funny that, like, no matter, it, it, that always appeals to me. And I always find it funny how other, like I didn't grow up with any of this. So, you know, but for me, um, I always find people that are like, you know, oh, this, you know, the world is an accident, the big bang, whatever. And so I always try to remember like, oh, no, it isn't. You know, but I try not to tell people that. But like once in a while, like the other day it happened again, I was just like, not in a good space, but I was just like looking at like everything around here so lush and green or whatever. And this girl was like standing next to me while we were, I was outside of the park and then she was like, what are you doing? He's like, just breathing, you know, just breathe. And looking at everything and she's like, oh, it's just an accident. I'm like, oh, please, are you serious? Like, why do people, I said, what's an accident? She said, oh, just the world. And I'm like, little ducklings cross by and the green and the flowers and blah, blah. And I'm thinking, no, you idiot, it's not an accident. You know, I didn't say any of this. And I'm always finding, like, why do people believe that? You know, like, how can you believe that? So it's interesting so, that yeah. what, that I mean, what, wow, that you're saying that. There was an interesting... Yeah, like what? Uh, ...teaching by the Lubavitcher Rebbe that said, when you don't really access and develop your imuna in God, then the Yetzirah takes your faith and makes you believe in things that are ridiculous or not based on. Right. So, like the more right. So the more a person develops, if you look at the word emuna, it comes from the word leamen. Emuna is faith, and leamen is to train. So you have to keep training, right. and it's a workout to bring out this faith in your heart that you were born with. It's a, an inheritance. It's in your kishka. It's in your DNA of your soul. Right. But if you don't exercise it and develop its potential of coming to birth out of your, of your soul, then you, you, the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, takes it and uses it to have faith in things that are... Like that are nonsensical. I mean, this, this is this is also Norfolk, Virginia, where there's not, you know, most people, more so, are not Jewish. So their whole, you know, oh, it's an accident or this or that, and I'm just like, how is that possible? Like, I'm sorry. Even when I wasn't, you know, I grew up very secular. Even when I was, I didn't believe it was an accident. I mean, it's like, I really, that's a crazy thing. Like, I'm sorry. Right. It's, it's like the the, the example of like, you know throw words in a pile and it, by accident it becomes a greatest novel. Like it's impossible. Or throw the pieces of a watch and it becomes a watch. Nobody did it. It's an accident. It just happened to be a watch. Like even those simple things like, come on, a nursing baby, the mother has ready-made milk. Like it just it had to have some creator behind and scheming and, and yeah. So one of the Lubavitcher Rebbe's teaching is that 
that not only do you have to develop faith in God, but you have to develop the faith in yourself of how godly you are, as we were talking earlier. Yeah. I mean, just go look at a waterfall. Like, really? <laughs> wow. I sometimes want to just slap people. I'm like, come on, really? Seriously. Well, that's where the tall, yeah, that's where we have to like, I mean, yeah, I know you don't want to, but, but that's where we develop more tolerance and compassion for people who don't see things, oh, yeah, yeah. It's an opportunity to just yeah. like really be, funny. yeah, to be grateful for what we do see and, and feel bad for them, those that don't and just be a living, walking example of wanting them to, you know, um, yeah. See the light like we see, hopefully. We'll see yeah. more and more of that light. True. Well, thank you for tonight. Thank you. Amazing. Blessings to you all for joining, and I hope more and more opportunities to be together and share more miraculous moments. Where in California do you live? I actually am in the Beverly Wood area, amazing community. I really am, really feel blessed. I've met so many amazing neshamas here and soul partners in, in, you know, gathering together to do good things here. Like, it really, it was a really smooth merge. I used to live in New York, actually. Oh, I'm from outside of Boston. Wow. Originally. So have you taken out a loan for gas yet? Well, actually, we got an electrical car way before gas prices went up. But yeah, we've been very fortunate. Oh, you're that smart. Yeah, it, it really is, uh, especially when you don't really travel so much here and there. I don't really travel so much. So, it, 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 the, mm. you know, it lasts a pretty long time, you know, and you have a charger in your home and you charge it like you charge oh. your phone. So it's really convenient. Oh, okay. And you get like free, there's many places all the way, anyway, in LA where you could just get free, uh, <laughs> free, uh, you know, electrical like charge. Electric car, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that they make it I user, yeah, they make it user friendly so you get free electrical charge in many, all places of, in LA. It's exciting. Even, be careful, somebody might steal it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I wouldn't be shocked. Wow. So I'm um, just wondering if there's anyone else on the line, just so because I'm so glad to meet all of you, really. Thank you so much. This session is no longer Thank being you. recorded. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any questions out there on Facebook, actually? <laughs> See if there are here. Wow. Blessings.